You're listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, with service members from across the military, sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome to the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week. Lots to get to, actually, before this week's episode. Got to start with this. I can't believe it. We want to give another shout out to another listener who donated to the podcast last week. This one goes out to Kevin F. Kevin, thank you so much for the donation. I mean, we greatly appreciate it. Again, guys, I promise you, we do not keep a single dime of whatever you donate to us. Each donation goes right back into paying the cost for putting this podcast together, rolling out an episode each week. Whatever is left over, we will donate to any of the charities that you have heard here, and we'll spread it out as we go across and we come across more of these. But also, those donations help keep the episodes ad-free so we can focus on telling each guest story without interruption. Kevin also wrote in to say, quote, as someone who will be joining the Army very soon, I can say that your podcast has done so much for aspiring soldiers like myself and everyday civilians. It's great to hear that this show is having a positive effect on people, and we certainly can't thank you all enough, the listeners, for the support you give our podcast each and every week. Also, I want to remind you guys about the Amazon promotion. Go to our website, hazardground.com, and click on that Amazon banner. Do your normal Amazon shopping. We get a percentage of what you spend And then we will take that percentage and dole it back out to a lot of the charities and great veterans organizations that you've heard featured here on the Hazard Ground podcast. Don't forget to follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground at Hazard Ground podcast. And now with all that out of the way, let's get on to another amazing episode of the Hazard Ground. Joining us this week is an active duty Army Master Sergeant who is also a Green Beret. He had seven total deployments to the Middle East and Africa. Throughout his time in the military, not only did he sustain combat wounds, but he also, during his career, has suffered from lead poisoning, which he has subsequently overcome. We'll get into that a little bit more later on. And he is also somebody who helped create the Special Forces Health Initiative Program, which benefits Special Forces soldiers and their health problems after the military is over for them. He is Jeff Dardia joining us on the Hazard Ground Podcast. Jeff, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh, Very uh, humbled to be here. So before we get started, I forgot to just mention that one of the other things that you did was develop the Task Force Dagger Foundation of Health Initiative Program. This happened because you sought outside care of the conventional medical system, so you started a transformational health experience that you later continued with the Cleveland Center for Functional Medicine, and you can check everything out there on the website taskforcedagger.org. Okay, so there's a lot to get to here throughout your career, Uh, and one of the most interesting things we did in kind of getting to know you prior to recording is that you almost became a Navy SEAL before you ended up becoming a Green Beret. Um, I'm interested to hear that whole story, but let's go back to the very, very beginning and tell us how you got in the military. Okay. Um, so since I can remember far back, I always knew I wanted to be a commando. Um, wasn't sure which type at first until I got a little older and understood who did what I grew up on the ocean. Uh, I grew up surfing. I spent every second I had at the beach. Uh, you know, that's where my home was. And I wanted to do something that involved the water and be a commando. And that was to be a frogman. And, uh, as fate would have it, I ended up being a type of frogman just with the army. Um, as a maritime operator. So I I got where I wanted to go, just a a different pathway than I originally thought. All right. So you grew up on the, on the coast, on the ocean, which ocean are we talking about? Just out of curiosity. We're talking Northeast. I grew up in uh, Maine. Okay. So on, on the coast in uh, cold water. So that was fitting for when I went out to Coronado. So I was pretty much conditioned for that environment. Now, when you decided to go into the Navy um, or at least to listen, try to go become a Navy SEAL, what was your thought process? Did you get a BUDS contract back then? Did they even have them? So, uh, yes, it was called the Dive Fair Program back then. It's now called, uh, I believe, the SEAL Challenge. And uh, I went in and it was guaranteed, to, you know, if you pass the screen test, that you'd get a, a BUDS contract to go. So during basic training, you had to try out for that. You had to go do the screen test. And once you pass the screen test, you worked out what they were called dive motivators back then, SEAL instructors that were assigned to Great Lakes, Illinois. And we PT'd with them every morning at like four in the morning before your, uh, your, your regular, you know, 
Navy training began for the day. So we did twice the PT as everyone else there. And then once you were selected and screened, that's what we did for the entirety. And then after you graduated basic training, you got to pick your, uh, your rating. And I chose to be a parachute rear because I thought at that time you'd get to jump out of airplanes. I'd figured out knockout airborne school before I went to Bud. So one last hurdle I'd have to jump through uh, after I graduated. But so um, literally after I graduated basic training and took that uh, rating, they would switched that and you no longer went to jump school as a rigger. So it became the air crew survival equipment. And I believe that's what it's called now. So gotcha. Now, what year did you start Bud's? So 1997, May of 97 is when I reported there. Okay. 26 weeks. Uh, we've talked about it so much on the podcast. Uh, kind of yeah. just give me your maybe best and worst memories of Buds. What stands out to you the most? What did you take from it? So uh, right off the bat, it, it's the best, worst time of your life. Um, definitely hands down the most physically, mentally grueling thing I've ever done in my life. Everything always goes back to that time there on the beach. Uh, set me up for success for everything else I didn't like, um, yeah, especially going through the special forces pipeline. Um, I always had that to go back on to. If I survived that, I could do anything. So that, that forged the, uh, you know, my drive to get through anything else in life that forged who I was, you know, I, I don't believe you can teach people that I believe they have it. And they bring that out in you. They find out if you have that ability to drive yourself that far. Um, I don't think that's something that can be learned. So it definitely forges that into you. Um, that's like I said, that program hands down, um, testing me to my mental and physical limits beyond anything else I'd ever done. Now, obviously as we labeled you a green beret, you don't become a Navy SEAL. Why and how does it end? So, uh, so I was one of, I, I believe, uh, less than two dozen originals in my original class. I was a phase three guy. So I went through all three phases, uh, all at once, no roles. I got into phase three after hell week. Well, I'll go back, uh, during hell week. Um, I got pretty sick. A lot of us had like cellulitis and pneumonia and stuff. And they'd given us, I believe it was fluoroquinolone, Cipro, uh, to try to fight all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, God knows what else we had in us at the time, too. But I got uh, crushed by a boat in Hell Week and then heard a loud pop and snap in my leg. Had no idea what it was. Kept going on it all the way through Hell Week. Um, just chalked it up to pain. You know, we would say pain is weakness, leaving the body, right? Suffering, silence, and all, all those good things. And um, I gutted through it, uh, through dive phase. At the end of dive phase, we had to do a five and a half uh, nautical mile ocean swim. And by the time I got done that swim, I could barely move my leg. And then that, that continued through the end of phase two, where I was duct taping my ankles and, uh, and my knees because I was in so much pain on my left side. And then uh, right in phase three, uh, we start all the runs get longer, the times get shorter and you start doing a lot more physical. And, uh, I just started falling apart. My body wasn't recovering uh, every joint in my body pretty much had tendonitis. I was snapping, popping, creaking, uh, and my hair started turning gray when I was 21 years old and didn't think of anything. Then I'm just like, wow, man, this program is really tough. But <laughs> looking back at it now, looking at other people who weren't breaking down as fast as I was, well, come to find out, you know, 20 years later that fluoroquinones cause tendon ligament rupture, you know, and mitochondrial dysfunction that it causes neuropathy and all these things I was experiencing then had no idea that I'm a guy that cannot take those drugs. I've been genetically tested. Um, I'm a poor methylator. So I got two snips of methylation deficiency, right? Had no idea until, you know, figuring all this stuff out now, like, holy God, had I known then that could have prevented me from taking those types of meds. I probably would have graduated and been a seal, but you know, Back then, it was the biggest kick in the nuts you could ever have. Now you see it. Hey, I got to where I needed to be, and all these things happened to me for a reason. I'm able to use these to help other people. So my friends joke, we call it the stigmata, you know, like how come you're the canary in the coal mine with all this stuff? But what I used to think was a curse is now a blessing because I'm able to mm -hmm. educate people and use all these experiences to help other people and prevent other people from having to experience that type of stuff by, you know, better decision making, but being they, aware of your environment. When they medically discharge you um, from the Navy and you're told you're not right. going to be a SEAL because of all these injuries and everything that you had, you were medically dropped from from SEAL training. I mean, are you devastated because this is what you always wanted to do? 
Well, absolutely. That was the biggest crushing blow of my entire life, like hands down, like no if, and, or but about it. I, my plan was death or graduation. I Failure wasn't an option. Quitting was never in my mind. I'd rather die than quit. Um, but I, I didn't. I got med rolled. I spent two months in PTRR, and uh, I think it was about two months, and I watched my class graduate, and that was like the worst thing I could ever experience in my life. Like seeing everyone walk across the stage and you're sitting there like, man, this sucks. And uh, I was like, get me out of here. And I asked the class back up. I wasn't better at all. They couldn't figure it out. They were like, well, we, we've never seen a guy this young have this many, you know, all your tendons and ligaments. You look like a seven year old man. And um, when I classed back up, I was still doing well, still passing everything. And we had to do our 14 mile run before we went out to San Clemente Island while we're right after demo. And, uh, I stepped in a hole, I think about eight miles into the 14 mile run. I heard a pop in my hip and I was like, uh Oh, and massive amounts of pain. Didn't fall out of the run. Didn't fall back, you know, finished the run, had to limp back to my barracks room at the end of the day, could barely move. And then the next morning I woke up, I couldn't lift my leg up and I'm like, Oh God, I got a four mile time run today. Ran, didn't fail the run. I almost failed it by two seconds. I was in first phase. I was running phase three times. I think I ran like a 28, 30 average in first phase. And uh, running was never an issue with me. You know, swimming, I wasn't the best at. But I, again, in phase two, I was doing phase three times. So um, I, I was going. And then finally, one of the instructors looked at me. And he's like, hey, bud. He's like, I, I can tell you're in a lot of pain. What's going on? You're having a hard time concentrating. You know, I was scared. I was like, I didn't want to get med dropped. I didn't want to get med rolled and pulled out. So I didn't want to say anything. But he's like, look, buddy. He's like, you know, the instructors are taking notice that, you know, something's going on. And I told him what was happening. He's like, all right. He's like, I want you to take, get a Red Cross message and go home on emergency leave. And he's like, I want you to go get some tests done. And he wrote down all the tests to get done. And he's like, go get these things looked at. So I did. I flew home. It was like a three-day weekend. I flew home, saw a sports medicine doc. And when they looked at my x-rays and MRIs, they were like, what the hell did you do? What happened to you? And I told him where I was. And they're like, uh, dude, you look like a 70 year old man. Like you have arthritis in your hip. You have tendonitis and bursitis everywhere. He's like, you're degenerative. You're falling apart. And I was like, well, okay, whatever that means. But can I go back and finish this training? They're like, we're not going to recommend you do this. They're like the way the ship, uh, the shape your hip is in that could break. He's like, if you, if you do that, you're going to be in a wheelchair. He's like, you're not going to be finishing anything. So I went back, I showed my class proctor and my doc the reports of what they found. They're like, I'll never forget one of my other instructors, like, hey, if you still want to shoot people, you can go work for the post office. But he's like, we can't send you to San Clemente Island like this. They're like, you know, we're going to throw the rock on you. We're going to make you run. You're going to do the obstacle course. If your hip goes, you're done. They're like, we can't in good conscience let you go out there. And that's not what you want to hear. You know, that was like someone taking a knife and stabbing it through your back. Um, that was like the worst blow I've ever had. So dealing with that, 21 years old, right? Literally, I had completed over 22 out of 26 weeks of training. And, you know, all I had was my FTX at the island, basically. The last week was an admin week, and then I went to airborne school. I had already had my invitations for graduation filled out. You know, I had my orders where I was going to be going. So this, like my family was like already planning coming off my graduation. So it was like the rug was pulled out from underneath me. But um, I'd been there for so long. Like I said, I was, I was an original phase three rollback. So I was a brown shirt. I helped all the instructors, PTR, took all the new guys out with the Oak course, helped out during hell week. So they did everything they could to keep me around. You know, they sent me over to SEAL Team 5 for as long as they could keep me. But back then in the Navy, they had no way to protect you. So your rate was short in the Navy. They constantly tried to pull your rate to go work in the fleet. Well, on my contract, it said if I got hurt or injured and out of my control, that I had the ability to get out. So what they did was they're like, all right, you know, we'll keep you here. You know, we'll keep checking on you medically. I was in a leg cast up to my friggin' knee. So I wouldn't, it would tell mobilize me from running or walking. And, uh, they're like, Hey, you know, we'll reinstate you back phase three post Mount Laguna post land that phase. And, uh, we'll get you back in as soon as we can. Well, that, that lasted for a few months. And then, you know, they kept trying to send me to like Italy and Jacksonville, like, Hey, go out to all these places. They need you. You're a parachute rigger. And they pulled top cover for me as long as they could. And finally the command master chief at the time pulled me in his office. He said, Hey, look, buddy. He's like, I, I'm going to be gone soon. I can't guarantee you the next person that comes here 
is going to be able to pull top cover like this and you can get sent to the fleet. Do you want to risk that? I was like, I'd rather die than go to the fleet. I was <laughs> like, no, I've, I've worked too hard. I was like, I'm never going to the fleet. That was like when you're in training, they put you on the beach and surf towards you and they, they look out in the, on the, you know, on the horizon, look at the carrier. Is that where you want to be? You, you'd rather die than quit. So that was not an option. So they're like, okay, you know, we'll get you out. We'll get you out with a medical discharge, but we'll give you a reentry code to get you back in when you can. If you're waverable to come back in, you'll come back in. So I was like, great, no problem. Well, when I hit the VA, I was at 80% disability. So I, I got out separated with 10% with the Navy and then hit the, the VA, I was at 80%. And they're like, we've never seen a kid 21 years old. I wasn't asking to get, this is before people tried to get high ratings for disability, right? Yeah, right? Yeah. I had no idea what the VA was, what kind of monster I was dealing with. This is stuff I legitimately had, didn't have to be coached what to say, had no idea what to say. I was only 21. And uh, they were like, you know, holy crap, you got, you know, neuropathy, epicondylitis, all the itises I had. And I'm like, it was back to me back then. That was all Spanish. I had no idea what they were talking about, but you know, I just knew I had chronic sinusitis. My guts were all messed up. You know, my fingernails were all ridged and skin peeling off my hands. I was breaking down. So I was captain catabolic. And, but going back looking, I know, I know exactly what it was and what it was from. So, but yeah, I mean, talk about a, you know, an experience when you're 21 years old, I didn't have a backup plan. I didn't have a pace plan. So that was it. So when I got done that, I was lost. And, uh, a lot of reflection of, Oh shit, what am I going to do now? Right. And, uh, so, you know, I was like, whatever I got to do, I know I can't, you know, punish myself. I can't self-medicate and use booze or drugs or anything, you know, to get over this. I'm like, I can't drink and I can't do anything like this. I'm, I'm going to have to leave Southern California or I'm going to be in a dumpster because you know how it is out there. It, mm -hmm. You want to party, it's there. Absolutely. So I went back to Maine. I went back to Maine and started all over again. So uh, I, I was like, well, I'll find, I'll find something else that will do this. And I'll, I'll get back in one way or another. I didn't give up. I said, I'm going to go back, but I just got to figure out a way how. That, that's a whole nother story. Sure. <laughs> well, you're in college at the time back in Maine and 9-11 uh, happens. And uh, yeah. I, I guess, was it, you know, uh, not only a desire of yours to be a commando, but, you, you know, the patriotism angle that pushed you to try to look for another avenue? Well, it, it was, I tried going back in. So I got out uh, basically the very beginning of 99. And then I was like, well, I'll go, I got voc rehab. I'll go to college. So I started college. Uh, and I was going, I'm like, yeah, this is great, but you know, this is not where I want to be. I'll just do this to do this. Check that block. It'll open more doors for my career somewhere else. And then, um, I started, I think it was 2000, it was around 2000. I went back to the recruiters and I was like, Hey, I'm ready to go back. You know, I had to the Navy been, recruiters, right? Yeah. Okay. I went back to the Navy recruiter and they're like, what? They looked at my, my VA stuff. They look at my DD 214. They're like, you were already medically discharged. Do you think going back to this program or this life is going to be doable if you did it fully healthy and you didn't do it again? <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, Hey man, just give me a shot. And they're like, we can't do that. This is prior to September 11th. They're like, Nope, we don't take fire service. It's never going to happen. So go kick another door. I was like, Oh, I'll go be a PJ CCT, something in special operations. And they're like, Nope, no prior service, 80% disability. Yeah. Right. So I, I got, you know, laughed out of MEPS for basically two years. And then I was like, well, I can go to the army. They, there's really no pipeline to go be anything special, but it, at your worst day in the army, you're, you're still wearing camis and you get a gun. You're not on a ship scrubbing decks. I was like, your worst day in the army is better than your best day on a ship. So I was like, we'll find something in here. I'll, I'll go to some high speed infantry unit or do some. So I started shopping around and active duties like, Nope, can't take your prior service, 80% disability. So I started working with a uh, national guard recruiter. I was like, there's a, a mountain warfare unit at Jericho, Vermont. I was like, I'll go do this, get some high speed training. They tried uh, for about another six, seven months. And then they're like, Hey, we're told by our command, we, you're never going to get in the military. So just give this up. So I was like, Oh, here we go. And then as fate would have it, one of the other recruiters from the same office was a reserve recruiter. He's like, hey, I might be able to work some magic. He's like, we put guys, prior service guys into the reserves all the time. He's like, you know, we might be able to pull some strings for you. I tried that. 
nothing, nothing. They were basically saying, leave this guy in MEPS. This guy's a pain in the ass. He doesn't give up. You know, he just can't take no for an answer. So they left me up at MEPS. And uh, finally, I was like, all right, I experienced all this bureaucracy and red tape and, you know, BS getting out of the military. I said, there's always one person who can make shit happen. So I'm like, who is this one person that can sign my waiver to get me in the army? And they laughed. They're like, oh, that's Colonel William Wong down at USAREC in D.C., and if I ever meet that guy today, I'm going to buy him a beer and dinner and give him a big hug. But <laughs> I'm like, give me his email address and uh, I'll take care of the rest. So they're like, oh, OK, you know, wise ass. And they gave me the email address and I wrote the guy a letter, which I still have in my office right now, explain my situation, what had happened to me in the Navy. I was like, just give me the opportunity. I'll crush any pipeline you give me. Just let me go. And uh, it was right after September 11th. And I was in the Army the next day in the reserves. but. Um, I was in and my foot was in the door. Everything that I was told that was never going to happen, happened. I was one example of that. So, um, got in, I started out in a reserve drill sergeant unit up in Saco, Maine, the second and 304th. And, uh, the Colonel, there was a Colonel from, uh, Vietnam, uh, Colonel Greenwood. And he, he saw me and he's like, what the hell's an E2 doing with a dive bubble? And he's like, what's your story, son? And I explained to him what happened. He's like, holy crap. He's like, all right. He's like, you're going to be my PVIC. He's like, you're doing PT and field exercises. So he's like, you got a lot of training that most people here don't have. So he's like, I'm going to take full advantage of that. I'm going to help you out in return. So he did. And he's like, I'll promote you fast as possible to get you to E4 promotable to get you to selection so you can go SF. And I was like, absolutely, sir. Thank you. So I sat in that unit. I want to say it was about eight months. One day he uh, pulled me in his office He's like, hey, Darty, he's like, you still want to be a Green Beret, right? And I was like, absolutely, sir. He's like, you ever heard of SF Babies? And I was like, uh, no, not sure what you're talking about, but I'll take your word for it. He's like, well, I was one in Vietnam. He's like, you don't have to do any regular Army bull crap. He's like, you're going to go to Airborne, you're going to go to Selection, and you're gonna, if you make it, you're going to go through the Q course and then go to war. I was like, sounds good to me. So that's exactly what I did. He did a conditional release on me, took an 18 X-ray contract, and uh, went in. That was May of 2003, and I've been going since nonstop. It's incredible. As you have to go through airborne school, you talked about your problems with your hips and everything else. You know, a lot yeah. of blown out knees and a lot of bad backs coming out of airborne school because guys don't land correctly or know right. exactly what they're doing. But you didn't have any physical issues doing any of that. So as soon as I stopped taking all the anti-inflammatories and all the drugs they were giving me and actually started like what was called recovery and rest and not overtraining and being more aware of what I was doing to myself through my lifestyle and environment, all those things went away. It literally take away what doesn't belong with you, add what's missing and things start working right, right? So I started learning about acupressure, acupuncture and all these things way back when, after that happened to me. So I started applying those things. I had a physical therapist who's into all that and he helped me out. And uh, I, it took me about two years where I could run and do push-ups again, pain-free. But after I started eating right and taking care of myself, all that stuff went away. And uh, when I went through, I didn't, I didn't miss one day of training going through the Q course. I ruptured a ligament in uh, Robin Sage. That was it. But was never physically ill, never had any of those problems. You're sore as hell. Your feet are always beat up and your back sore from a 120-pound ruck. But uh, nothing compared to what I did in Coronado, I can tell you that. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So you found, you spent, you found, uh, uh, the SFAS, you know, assessment selection in the Q course, physically less no. challenging than buds. Absolutely. But the hardest thing about special forces, the Q course in the pipeline is that everything you do in buds, you're getting evaluated in a team or a boat crew, right? Mm -hmm. So you're never assessed by yourself unless you're in the pool doing a pool event or something like that, like not tying or drown proofing when it's not a team event, right? In SF, you did everything as a team in a team event and only a couple of days you were assessed. You know, I'm, let me rephrase that. You did everything as an individual and then only a short duration you did team week, right? right. Team so events. it's the opposite. So complete opposite, right? So I was used to having someone chase me around the beach of Coronado with a bullhorn screaming in my face. All you had to do was what the hell you were told to do. You didn't. It wasn't really a thinking man game until you got later into die phase and, and phase three with weapons and demo, right? The Q course was the most intellectually challenging, where it was like the fire hose. 
you learn more information in the shortest amount of time. There's no other pipeline that learns as much as we do. And you're expected to be way more mature and work as, you know, a separate entity from a team. And that's what they're looking for. Someone who can be trusted to do things the right way and, you know, do things right the first time without being micromanaged. Right. Mm-hmm. So anyone can be told what to do, you know, go seize an airfield, do whatever, but you can't pick a 23 year old and put them in an embassy. Right. So they're looking for a different type of operator. And that was the most challenging thing for me. I was like, this is a thinking man's game. This is what they're looking at. And the further you go through the pipeline, the more mature you get, you see exactly what they're looking for. So, I mean, physically, I've never carried a rucksack as heavy as I did in the Q course in my entire life. The tech sucks the life out of you um, and walked that long of a distance. Like in Hell Week, we did it. We ran with a damn boat on our head, you know, for a week straight. Uh, That's the furthest I've ever walked or run in my life. But I've never been in the woods by myself with something that heavy on my back where it's like, I have to tell myself to do this. I'm, I don't have a guy with a bullhorn forcing me to do it, right? So you had to dig deep in yourself with no one telling you what to do and figure all these things out on your own. So that was a completely different experience. And I think that's what a lot of guys miss. You know, everyone's like, oh, we're better than the SEALs or the SEALs are better than us. We're different. And, you know, I learned stuff from both organizations that made me a completely better person and a better operator. And I, I take the good from both programs that I learned. And it made me who I am, um, hands down. Well, and um, I, I think the key to that, as you said, you're different for different reasons, obviously. You do different right. things. The different mission set is different. Sets. So, you, yep, you, you obviously, you better be different. And, and that's what makes, you know, you guys so elite in and of yourselves is just that, that because the mission set is vastly different and it's not like anything conventional forces do, we right. need you to be different. You know, yes. duplicating more of the same, um, yep. it's not necessarily a waste per se, but you get the point. Like, you're asked to just do different things all yep. over the place. So You're a teacher. You're a, fo- you're a force multiplier. So. Exactly. As a, a, different types of operators, you know, they don't do FID, they don't do UW, you know, a lot of them are starting to do all that stuff now. But, you know, that was our mission set is one, you're always a shooter, right? But you have to be able to take what you know and teach other people to enable them, right? We're, we're building capability, not capacity. So we, we have to work ourselves out of a job. So we have to be able to do that. And that's our bread and butter, right? So anyone can go, you know, throw a hand grenade in a bunker and blow something up. But to be able to take, you know, someone with a third grade level education and teach them the skill set of a commando and then teach them how to be autonomous eventually, that's a different skill set than, you know, just doing DA or HR or any of those mission sets. It's those are real unique capabilities and require an incredible skill set but they're limited in scope. So you have to be able to do 10 mission sets. You know, we have 10 core activities in SOCOM and you have to be pretty proficient in all those things and have a working knowledge of all of them, not just two or three. You know, a a lot of guys, you know, I, I was guilty of it when I came into SF, all I thought was DA, you know, I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? I signed the wrong line. And then as you come to figure out what you actually do as an organization, your eyes are open. You're like, oh, okay, I get it. Now I know why these old school guys were trying to tell me these things. And it all makes sense. You're like, okay, now I know I was getting my nose bloody. Right. But, you know, we don't do great. Recruiting does not do any type of good expectation management with that because it's still a problem. Mm -hmm. You know, guys come in, they're like, I came to kick doors, you know, and, uh, you know, knuckle drag and do all these cool things. And they're like, I get here. I have to do what? I have to teach classes with a whiteboard in the, in the desert. What, what is this? So it's, uh, it's a different mission set. We can do all of those mission sets. And that's what makes a green gray what they are is being able to be flexible and be a problem solver. So that's where we make our money. There's a couple of interesting things you said there. One for the non-military audience. When Jeff said DA, he just means direct action. I just said kicking doors down and finding bad guys and bringing them to justice. But I thought it was really well said that you said we're building capability, not capacity. And just to quick note that popped in my head. We need more of that in government right now. We need building more capability and less building capacity. And I think if if politicians understood that concept, we'd have a much more forward thinking and progressive institution leading us uh, going forward. Absolutely. And that's the program I do for Task Force Dagger. I've applied all the same principles and fundamentals from unconventional warfare into unconventional medicine. It's the same frameworks and principles, right? Looking root cause of dysfunction, root cause of an insurgency, understanding the operational environment, assessing the hazards, right? Identifying the hazards, all those things. Taking the operational art and design and the ops process and all those things, 
applying it to a different problem set, medicine, medical problems. It, it works the same way, whatever sure, problem set yeah. you throw at it, right? So getting what I've been doing is teaching non, you know, special operators, medical providers, how we think and operate and plan and, you know, do intel. And then helping the Army folks who don't speak medical understand that operational environment and get mutual understanding and situational understanding, you know, situational context of what the problems we're facing as an organization, cancer, suicide, you know, TBI, PTSD, all these things that are killing us way more than any enemy could ever dream of. So that's our problem. You do a center of gravity analysis and look, you know, what makes our organizations go It's humans. It's the human operator, people. And we cannot function as an organization without healthy, able bodies. Well and uh, it doesn't matter what equipment you develop, what type of training you develop. If you can't impart that on something that's healthy and capable, it's completely worthless. You have to get people healthy at a young age and smart and get them that way in the vessel until they're old enough to join the military and get into special operations. So if you look what's happening right now, all the, the too, fa uh, too fat to fight and all these articles, almost 80% of the population ineligible to join the military, right? Because of weight reasons, behavioral health, criminal reasons, whatever it is, our younger generations, aren't ca they can't fill the bodies, right? They can't fill the uniforms with healthy bodies, what I meant to say. Right. But we have a problem with readiness, right? And uh, what I'm trying to do is, is not just fix the suicide and the cancer problem for guys that are already in, but I want to set up the environment so we can still get healthy, able bodies to join. It, this is something we have to go from day one. It starts in the household. So it's, it's an environment, not just environmental change, but it's a paradigm shift in the way you look at health, right? It's ownership of health. From the day you're born, you eat what your parents tell you to eat, right? You don't make your decision. They put what's on the plate, you eat it. Those habits follow you for the rest of your life. Sure. And hopefully yeah. you're intelligent enough to figure out that, hey, growing up in macaroni and cheese and hot dogs and Coke is probably not a good idea and you change your habits, right? But most people don't. And the physical, uh, physiological impacts of that when you're three, four to 10 years old carry with you for the rest of your life. It sets you up for failure. So that's what we're seeing now, right? Um, we're seeing people, two out of three Americans obese or overweight. Uh, you've seen Alzheimer's and autism, all the rates skyrocketing through the roof. That's environmental. It's from our environment, our lifestyles. Makes and it's sense. damaging our genes. It's epigenetic. So we're passing this down, right? So as future generations go, we're getting less and less able bodies and less and less resilient bodies to do the job we're asking them to do. So that that's a huge problem. It's a vulnerability, right? It's it's something, you know, as an intel guy that I always had to look for against the enemy. And uh, our enemies are not stupid, and they see this. And like I said, it's they they're they're smart too. They can mm -hmm. they will you know capitalize on any chance they get. Well, they, they learn to exploit our weaknesses. They, they identify yes. them and, and learn to exploit them. And, um, right. you, you know, that's something you deal with, uh, throughout your, uh, time deployed, which uh, I want right. to get to for you because right. while it's hard to encapsulate seven deployments to, uh, different continents and all across the world, but let's focus on, you know, the string of deployments that you went on because what you saw and what you went through, obviously, uh, kind of the crux of your military experience. Take me through, you know, from that first deployment moving on, kind of the nature of what your mission was, what you guys had to do, and and some of the things that you saw and went through. All right. Uh, first deployment to Afghanistan right off the bat, uh, pretty kinetic trip. I was in a bad area. It was like a Purple Heart factory, uh, Firebase Cobra. Anyone that's been over to Afghanistan or yeah. has gone Providence know what that place is all about. But I uh, hit the ground running. I uh, didn't really know what to expect. But our first real engagement were two near ambushes in one day. Uh, the second engagement, I was shot in the helmet. I had a PCAM round, trace around, come hit me, came through the truck, hit me in the back of the helmet, went to the inside of my body armor. Trace around was burning off, lit my hair on fire. Uh, still have the round in a box at my house. Really? Uh, when I went to get out of the vehicle, it fell out of my body armor and clinked on the armored seat. Did you know and, what it was uh, when it hit you? Uh, I watched it. I watched the actual round coming at me. So when the ambush kicked in uh, RPGs and PCAM rounds, I had night vision on, so I could see everything. So uh, here I was, I was actually driving the vehicle, had a saw in my lap and had night vision on. Our partner forces had their lights on and uh, they brought all the fire right on us. So when the ambush kicked off, I could see where everything was coming from right off the bat. 
And uh, I looked out the window, looked over, and I could see everything coming in at us. Could hear the rounds hitting the truck. And then when the round came in, I just felt a hot, hot like a flash. And uh, I got my head pushed forward, rung my bell a little bit. And then next thing you know, I'm like, hey, I think we're on fire. And I, I'll never forget my buddy uh, was up on the turret on the Mark 47. He's like, uh, no, dude, you're on fire. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we kind of laughed about it. And I'm like, hey, you know, you still alive? You still alive? It was pretty bad. It was pretty uh, intense firefight. Is so, anybody like thinking, or you think that time you lucky bastard? Uh, it, it didn't even cross my mind. I was just like, oh, I need to return fire, uh, get the vehicle behind some defilade and just start letting it rip. Um, I ended up dismounting the truck and going back into the ambush, uh, the kill zone of the ambush to actually get our partner forces, put them in a vehicle and get them out of there. And uh, that was a whole nother story. But that was my first time in a firefight where I actually took a casualty. It was a partnered force got shot through the side of the head, the driver of the Ford Ranger with the partnered forces in it. So it was, that was like a kind of a big wake up call, mm -hmm. but it was so much going on at once. You didn't have time to process everything. It, it probably wasn't until like a couple of days later when all of us were like sitting around staring at each other, like how the hell did we make it out of that? Right. I mean, yeah, the goal sure. of an ambush is to kill everything there. So us making out of two near ambushes one day, that was like, that was a pretty significant thing. I just remember saying to myself, I was like, man, if this is going to be like the rest of my trips, you know, I better make the, the best of life of, while I can, because, you know, I might not be coming home. That's, I had a kid after that deployment. I was like, I better do this now. <laughs> so yeah, that trip uh, was an eye opener, just driving over I, IEDs every day, not knowing if you're going to get blown up, you know? And then uh, my second trip was a different well, type of mission. Hang on one second. Let me let me interrupt you because when when you talk about you know going out there on the routine basis that you were and the dangers that you face and everything that was in front of you, yeah. do you ever get to a point where you're like, you know, man, we're, we're going to die. Like we can't keep doing this. Eventually, this is going to go bad for all of us. I, I don't want to sound cliche, but the second you accept your death, the more you can concentrate on work. Well, that's true. It, it, yeah, it was just one of those things where. It was like a, any one of these little culverts or crossings or, you know, LDAs could be, you know, ambush or an IED just waiting. I'll never forget, like, there's a place we used to cross a bridge crossing. And right before the bridge, we had driven that every day. You know, we thought we were clearing it pretty well. But there was an IED, some rain and washed it away. And there's two TC6 NA tank mines stacked, but the pressure plate in the initiating system got separated. So here we were driving over this thing every day. That could have been any one of us. So it was just things like that. It's, it, there's a little bit of luck, you know, a little bit, a little someone looking out for, you know, but it was just one of those things where you watch it happen. One of my, you know, one of my teammates got his leg blown off right in front of me. And it was just like, damn, you know, all of us are like, Hey, that could have been any of us, but it was just one of those things where you can't dwell on it. You have to concentrate on what you're doing, not what could happen, but what you need to do. So it just, you have to, you have to do that to get by. Did you feel like any of it got to a point where it was helpless and you weren't really making an impact? I mean, did the good outweigh the bad in those instances, so to speak? And when we first got there, we, we made a big difference in our area. So it was really unstable when we got there. And by the time we left, we, we had gotten pretty good control of it. But every time we left and another unit came in, it was like they had their own agenda. So every trip we went back, it was like starting over again. I'd say by after the third or third trip to Afghanistan, it was just like, okay, I'm just here to, you know, do what I have to do, make sure all our guys get home. You know, we, we knew what it was going to be. That war was not going to end while we were alive, bottom line. And uh, we, you do the best you can while you're there, make an impact in your area. And then the, the priorities get all your guys home, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we know the politics. I figured that out my first trip. And uh, you just look out for the guy to your left and right, and that's your priority. All right. So when you have to go back, uh, yep. you know, it's what's that old saying? Uh, they talk about, you know, war philosophers saying getting any, any man to go into combat once is easy. Getting him to go back a second time uh, when you realize how close you've come to dying. And, and like you talked about, that self-reflection doesn't happen while you're there. But when right. you get back and you realize, damn, I got to go do this. I mean, you know, th there's the odds keep getting stacked against me, so to speak. That, that going to combat for, I know the guys I work with is like the best thing we can do. Sure. It, that's where we're conditioned. That's where we're, you know, adapted to. Yeah, we thrive in that environment. It's the environment back home. Most of us struggle with. Um, the only thing that changed was after I had my child, 
um, my, my only kid is that you think twice about doing some other things, but, uh, for some guys, instead of killing themselves, they'd rather die in combat honorably. So going over there wasn't an issue. Um, I can't say that for everybody, but for a lot of people, I know that was, that's how it was. It was like, I'd rather die a warrior than have to fight my demons back home and then, you know, take my own life. So it, you had to mix everything in this bunch. Um, I like deploying. Deploying for me was where I could do my job and be good at it. Garrison is where I sucked, uh, <laughs> where I struggled, honestly. Well, you're not, you're not the only one who, uh, who suffers from that. Yeah, you're talking to somebody who does the same thing. I'm much more yeah. of an effective soldier when uh, I'm not dealing with paperwork and meetings yeah. and everything else. Um, you know, I, I kind of thrive in that, that live environment, so to speak. Um, but I, yeah. I, I think that's just some people work better that way. Um, yes. You know, the, the sense of purpose is greater. And especially when after you deploy, you go back to do all that paperwork stuff and kind of live that garrison lifestyle. You're like, listen, no one's going to die from this. Why are you getting this upset about something that really doesn't matter in the grand scheme of things? Like everyone, Absolutely. everything's going to be fine and you're losing your yeah. mind over something that really doesn't matter. Um, it's, it, it, you know, you gain some perspective, right? So you head back the second time. Yeah. Second time, a little slower pace. We were doing uh, a, a different type of deployment. We were doing more uh, work with Intel stuff. i leave it at that. And we were doing a lot of like cache weapon recovery and other work. And it wasn't as high paced. The danger was still there, but we weren't engaged like we were the first one. Um, I, I got to learn a lot about working with partnered forces as far as uh, working, planning operations, just the, you know, the admin, you know, like seven dash eight type stuff sure. of RTEP and, you know, come with red, amber, green cycles and getting these guys, you know, their staff functions done. That was a good learning tool, but not my type of training environment, but it, it paid its dividends on the, the following deployment, my third one. So, so a learning trip. When you were doing that Intel stuff, after you just talked about how much the, for lack of a better term, the thrill of combat really is what you kind of work towards. Uh, right. Was it less satisfying doing that type of work? Uh, like I said, I try to take the best out of it, um, a learning experience from it. No one, it's, no one wants to throw themselves in the ambushes, but you know, for me, it was just slow paced. I had a hard time as a young guy in the teams, like, you know, what are we doing here? We, you know, in other areas of the country, people are getting after it and you want to be there with your buddies. And, you know, you hear on the radio guys getting in firefights, you know, guys dying and you're just like, I'm over here we could be doing a lot more, you know, that was the struggle. That was the hardest part of that trip. Um, it, it wasn't the mundane work or, you know, look, digging for caches and doing Intel work. It was just, you know, you could be somewhere else with your buddies doing more stuff. That was the hardest part of that trip for me. When you go do that sort of mission and the lack of danger gets scaled down, do you, do are you the type of guy or do you feel like guys lost a little bit of their sharpness? So, uh, <laughs> the guys that were on the trip prior that were still on the team definitely did not, but a lot of the new guys, they never had anything to compare to. So sure, yeah, it makes sense. That can, they can get complacent. And that's our job as senior guys is to make sure that doesn't happen. But, uh, every time you leave the wire, you, you, there's a chance you're not coming home you know, on that trip. Guys did get blown up literally right. You know, IEDs right outside our wire foreigners coming to our camp got blown up. So it, the the danger was there. We did a really good job of finding the stuff before it got us. You know, we we interdicted a lot of things that could have been uh, bigger attacks, but we stopped them. So proactive trip, um, like I said, just wasn't as kinetic as my first one. One more big picture question before we get to the third deployment. You know, when you came to the realization of that first deployment, like this war is not going to end in our right. lifetime or while we're here, um, do you get a sense that doing this stuff is – not fruitless per se, but it doesn't really have a defined purpose because, I, I mean, I, I know this much. You know, we'd go clear an area on my deployment. We'd go clear an area of Baghdad. You know, you'd get through the streets and then, you know, everything would be fine for two or three months and then it's back again. It's like, well, yeah, crap, like what that, I mean, what, what are we doing here? We're just chasing our own tail. Yeah, we used to call that punching water. So it's like yeah. displacement, right? Mm -hmm. You go in there and they leave, you leave, they come back unless you're holding ground or maintaining a constant presence with some type of infrastructure. As soon as you leave, it's gone. It's, Vietnam is the same thing, right? Yeah. Uh, we, we fought for ground the next, we 5,000 people would die in a week and then we'd leave it the next day. Um, luckily we didn't have those casualties where we were, but 
it was almost the same principle. And we all knew this, like, but it was, again, your it's policies, right? Uh, mm-hmm. It's, hey, we don't have the assets to man this. We don't have, the, the, the locals don't want to secure it. It was just one of those things where like, all right, we have to prioritize what we're doing to have the most impact. And, and that's what the best part of being in special operations, you have that authority, not authority, but that freedom to do that, right? We can plan our own operations to have the most impact long as it supports the commander's intent. So we had a lot of freedom to do to make the most impact in our area. So that wasn't as bad as some of the conventional guys that were just told drive point A to point B every day and get blown up just because at the same time every day, you know, build those patterns of life. It was horrible watching that. Uh, for those guys in transportation convoys, and yeah, I was one know, of, that was one of them. That was what I did. <laughs> yeah, running, 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 running combat convoys. I mean, you know, yeah. uh, it, it's not like a badge of honor or anything, but I probably got about five or six thousand miles on the streets of Iraq over the course of fifteen months. And uh, yeah, you know, like you said, yeah. a little bit of luck, a little bit of grace of God. But um, yeah, you know, and, and for the civilians listening who aren't in combat, you know, anybody who's ever studied war, it people always ask the question, well, why do we have to have so many people there? Why, so, why do you have to be on ground? No one has ever won a land war without occupying territory. It, you just right. physically cannot win a war without occupying territory. Like that, it goes back to the game of risk. Remember the board game Risk? I don't know if you ever played absolutely. it. I mean, the oh, whole absolutely. The con- whole conquer the world. You literally have to put armies in each country to own it. And the only yep. way you're going to win any sort of combat um, over the long haul is to occupy territory. And and I think you phrased it perfectly from the standpoint of, you know, uh, displacement. You know, we, we occupy territory, we leave, and then they come right back. I mean, again, and uh, that's right. the hard part about occupation is, again, you have to leave people there. Like, you, you can't walk away. So um, Yeah, we, that, and that's the difference between conflict and war, right? We exactly, were technically yeah. weren't at war with Afghanistan. So no one wanted to occupy it, and we weren't there to— put up our flagpole. So we had to fight an insurgency, but if people didn't start figuring that out until halfway through the war on the conventional side, I mean, the, the common sense, Kuwait has never been invaded again. Why? Because we've had a military base there since yes. the, the first Gulf war. Like we are yep. physically there and they know that we're there and we're not leaving. Um, right. you know, it's, it's why Germany, you know, once the communists fell, it's like, we're still there, you know, like anyway, yeah. but round and round we go. Okay. So third deployment comes around. What's this one all about? So third one, that was one of my best deployments. Another real kinetic trip. Uh, great team. It was the best team I've ever been on. Um, one of the best missions we had, one of the most successful missions we ever had. But uh, we we rarely saw a dry hole. Every, every place we went, we got who we were looking for. Um, and we had a good impact on the locals. And uh, we built their trust up again. And then you know you're doing good in an area when people start turning in IDs and you know, telling you what's going on in the area and then turning in the bad guy. So real good, rewarding trip, uh, flying around in helicopters, you know, doing those things, driving, doing those things. Uh, really good, rewarding trip. Uh, didn't lose anybody on our team. Uh, no, only minor injuries, you know, and then uh, minimal loss with partner force. I don't even think we had one death. I think just a couple injured, but uh, real good trip, uh, huge impact on the area we were in. So much that the the head bad guys that were in the area left for Pakistan. <laughs> so they uh, they were like, "Hey, we'll wait these guys out until the next guys show up." So we we had a huge impact, uh, and it was a model that was used for a lot of following deployments of keeping guys in the same area they'd been in and building relationships. So uh, really good lesson learned on that one. Uh, familiarity, not only just with the terrain, but with the, the local people that's considered the local terrain, but mm-hmm. we had good rapport in that area. So we were doing the right things, uh, minimizing collateral damage, working with the partner uh, governments and police and, uh, you know, working with the local population. So Let me ask we were you, kinetic and non-kinetic the same way. How much, um, when you talk about tactics and techniques that the enemy was using, how much changed? Because I know for me, that was in my deployment, it was, it was a nonstop chess match. You know, the, the enemy did this and then we did a, to counteract it. Then the enemy did something different. Yeah. And then we did B to counteract it. And the enemy figured out how to stop us would be. And they did this. And then we had to go to C. like, it was just nonstop. How much did the, uh, I guess tactics and techniques change from deployment to deployment? I would say it was probably around 2011 or 12 when the, the biggest change happened in Afghanistan with foreign fighters, and other state actors giving, let's just say logistics and training to our enemy. 
And they started using, and they obviously the battlefield recovery they were doing on the Afghans, right? So they had night vision, body armor, American weapons, a uh, huge shift in tactics before they used to hit and run. And then they started fighting with aircraft overhead and actually shooting down helicopters while we were engaged, not leaving the battlefield, even with bombs dropping and helicopters flying, right? Um, I was in Tagab. Anyone who's been in that area knows exactly what I'm talking about. But uh, it, they started standing, holding their ground and, and maneuvering on us uh, while we were with air support. So that was a huge shift. And uh, after my 2009 trip, going back, I was an instructor from 9 to uh, 13. And then going back at the end of 13 and 14, it was completely night and day difference. One other personal question for you, um, you know, as it pertains to your health and everything that you went through, um, the lead poisoning, and everything else. Do you know at this point in time that anything is wrong with you? I mean, are you feeling like, man, I've taken too many headshots, too many explosions or whatever, and something is out of place or are you not aware of it at this point in time? No, I'm very aware. I've already, I've already battled this since 2007. It started, uh, it actually got better while I was in Afghanistan. And then when I came back, it was an instructor, uh, teaching CQB and breaching. That's when it hit me like a freight train. Um, I didn't know I had a problem until I stopped deploying. And then it, it was so bad where I was pretty much either going to suck, start a pistol or get better. And I stopped giving a crap about my career at that point in 2012. And I said, hey, I got to do something. Um, you know, that's right after I got divorced, it just everything started crumbling. And uh, it was just, I was dragging a dead body around. I had no short term memory, had a hard time learning new information, retaining information, massive fatigue, migraine headaches, balance problems, uh, depth perception problems. Uh, did any of your fellow soldiers vision. know? Did, did anybody Absolutely. around you know? They do? Okay. Uh, the ones that knew me the most did. But when you're working with other guys who are going through the same thing, it's normal. So there's not really anything to compare to unless you're really over the top. But once we started talking to each other, I'm like, dude, I got the same shit. But our guys don't self-identify. They're not going to say something's wrong because they know their career is going to be over. So everyone just sucks it up and self-medicates and powers through it until it comes to the point where they either would they do kill themselves or they do raise their hand and then they're riding the desk job and they're miserable. So our guys try to stay on teams as long as possible. And that's in 2012, I finally went outside the military through uh, care coalition, which is warrior care program now and got some advanced testing done and figured out what was going on with me. But uh, it was my environment, everything, chronic stress, over blast, overpressure, heavy metals, overuse of antibiotics while I was deployed. Um, it just all of it. It was, I had all of it, by the way, all those things cause neurotoxicity. So I fixed myself while I was in, in what well, the end of my instructor time, I got better. And then, uh, I went back to a team and then started deploying again. <laughs> and then, so I already knew what that was, what was causing it. And then I knew how to fix it. I empowered myself with the knowledge to repair and maintain myself. And then had a medical team outside of the military that was part of task force dagger where I started the program in 2012, 13, those guys were able to run tests that the military wouldn't even consider. And I was able to maintain and repair myself based on that. And then uh, once you identify these check engine lights that are going off, you can do things to address them by making better choices, right? Lifestyle right, yeah. and environmental choices. So before I had no idea. I, I didn't know what was wrong and I didn't know how to fix it. So can't fix a problem if you don't identify the problem, right? Right. Um, so... so let me just kind of understand this. And again, I, I try to always dress something with the mass audience because there are a lot of civilians who listen to this podcast. Um, you know, guys who don't want to self-identify, as you mentioned before, because they know their career is going to be over. Uh, I mean, it's such an interesting conundrum. I mean, imagine being an accountant and you no longer can do math, right? right. Imagine being a plumber and you can't hold a wrench. Um, uh, imagine being a driver and you can't feel, you know, your feet on the gas pedal. It's like, it's... I can only imagine the, you know, internal struggle of that in, in saying that, you know, if I say something, not only are you losing your livelihood, but it's something that you love. And and yeah. I think here's, your identity. Yeah. And here's the difference. It, you, you work so hard to get there, especially for special ops guys, Green Berets, Navy SEALs. You know, you're, you're less you're one percent of the one percent. Right. And so you're in such a select group to give that up unwillingly is a really tough thing. I mean, I think a lot of guys know when their career is over and, and when they're done and operators know, Hey, I've done enough, you know, I'm going to go do something else, but it's a decision they reach on their own. 
um, right. to have it taken away from you. Why is that that's a, so hard? That's a death sentence. That's a death sentence. Because I'll, I can tell you the same thing happened to me in my Navy career and that the rug was pulled out from me. I didn't have a backup plan. And if you go into that environment, for me, it was death or graduation, right? Mm -hmm. I'm going to do this. This is all I'm going to do. And you don't have a backup plan and that rug gets pulled out from you. It's like falling out of a building without a parachute, right? You're just, you're falling, you're helpless, hopeless, powerless, and you have no clear mission, purpose, or focus. That's a death sentence for our guys. Um, When you lose your identity and your purpose like that, then you're, what do I do now? And it's just, I'm not as good as I used to be, or, you know, I'm a let down. I'm letting my teammates down. I'm not there for them. And then it's just a constant fight. It's a battle against yourself and then a battle against your family and a battle against work. It's three of them you're letting down and that the guys feel like, Hey, I'm more of a burden than an asset. I'm just a pain in everybody's ass. I'm better off gone. And our guys are like wounded dogs. They'd rather go die in place in the woods somewhere than cause, you know, harm or shame on the unit or themselves for anything else. So it, that's a tough one. You talk to any guy who's contemplated suicide, they're going to tell you the same thing, right? You add prescription drugs. Thank God I didn't take them, but sleeping pills, opioids or antipsychotics or amphetamines, the zombie cocktail given to our guys after they do self-identify, it's a death sentence. And, you know, add insomnia, chronic stress, family problems, financial problems, and toxic exposures, all those things on top of it. And you, it's not a surprise why guys are killing themselves and getting cancer. So when do you it, when do you first hear about lead poisoning? So it was 2012. Okay. Um, after my first lab results for heavy metals came back, and they're like, "Whoa, buddy!" They're like, "You're packed full of lead, arsenic, mercury, thallium, gadolinium, uh, copper." And I was like, "Where?" You sound like you the know, freaking periodic table. It, yeah, that's pretty much what it was, but <laughs> it's literally all the ingredients that were in our munitions, right? Mm-hmm, yeah. So I'm like, okay, where's this stuff coming from? Figured it out. And so I was like, man, I've never been tested in my blood for lead. Uh, so they're like, hey, go to environmental health. You know, they might be able to pull records to see if anyone ever pulled uh, blood on you for lead. And I did. And the doctor there pulled it up and he's like, well, in 2007, where you're going through Sephardic, the shooting school, they're like, they pulled lead on you. And they're like, you started the course with a blood level of nine micrograms. And then after the end of the course, you were at 32 micrograms. Back in 2007, they told everyone if there were 40 micrograms and below, they were fine. We know that's not true. The DOD study in 2011 blew that out of the water. There's no safe amount. And you're getting permanent damage between two and five. CDC changed their acute toxic threshold to 10 micrograms. So here I was in a shooting school toward the very beginning of my career after four, well, eight, nine weeks of exposure in this course, my blood levels were at 32. That's three times over today's acute toxic threshold, right? In that school, I was suffering symptoms of lead toxicity and knew it and was telling people that I was having these problems with balance, with vision, with stomach pain, with not being able to remember anything. I was going home at the end of the day, forget how I got there. So it's swelling, intracranial pressure, migraines, you know, ringing in the ears, all those things that come from neurotoxicity and neuroinflammation, they were all there, had no idea what it was. Gutted it through, graduated that school, did two more Safawics, which are two six more two six week courses of doing the same thing back to back. Went down range on my uh, 2008, 2009 rotation, and then came back and became an instructor and did 16 classes as an instructor. Um, between Safawix, low vis training, the pistol training, and doing r- teaching our support guys. So I lived on the ranges and in the shoot houses nonstop. That's what I was doing. And by 2012, I was licking windows. I, w- I was literally dragging the shell, and I, I had no idea up from down. I was in survival mode at that time. And, uh, you know, I felt like I wasn't safe jumping out of airplanes, uh, you know, going through the houses, doing all that stuff. I was like, man, I feel like I'm in a, like, a, in purgatory here, I'm like floating above my body with no real control of what's going on. The the only thing, like they always say, training takes over. And luckily for that, you're just on autopilot. So when you're in your environment that you condition to, not really a big deal. But when you come home from work or have to do paperwork or, you know, garrison stuff, you're just lost in the sauce. You're, you know, you're staring at the, the walls. So that's where I was like, okay, and enough people like, dude, you're all right. You know, all the things I used to love doing that were I was outdoors, mountain biking, surfing. I stopped doing all that stuff and I would just 
the only thing luckily for me were my cars, my hot rods and stuff. I was like, man, I just got to do something positive and constructive or I'm going to go nuts. So that's what I used for that time period. So when do you start getting treatment? I think it's called chelation. Is that the word? I didn't get chelated until 2015. Okay. I, in 2012, I went through NICO, the National Intrepid Center of Excellence. I was one of the first SF guys to go through that program. Um, and I was up there and really didn't know too much about uh, all the heavy metal stuff. I was just learning at that point. But uh, I got linked up with another guy, Steve Hopkins. I don't know if you saw the New York Times article. Yeah. But but Steve and I were going through a lot of the same stuff. And he's like, you know, yeah, I'm getting the units trying to crush me. They think I'm a malingerer. You know, they're trying to, you know, ruin my career and send me to freaking, I think it was Texas and Alabama at first. And uh, he ended up getting moved to the Pentagon. And while he was moving to the Pentagon, he collapsed on his front doorstep and his dad got a medevac to Walter Reed. Thank God he went there and he was at the Pentagon where he got assigned because that's where he got linked up with Kevin Dorrance. Kevin Dorrance ran him through a full workup, couldn't figure it out, but he's like, hey, bud, you're not leaving the hospital until we figure this out. We got your back. First time in his career, someone told him that. First time in his career, like recent career, that he's like, okay, I think I feel better about this. Someone actually cares about me, doesn't think I'm crazy. But he finally worked him up for heavy metal toxicity and he got him a KXRF bone net x-ray. And he's like, holy crap, bud, you're packed. He was like five times over. Uh, for bone lead levels for someone his age. And then Steve's like, hey, you need to go, you need to come up here and see Dr. Dorrance and go get checked out. So I went up there, I got a prescription for KXRF. I came back and I was over twice the limit. So I was 30% over. And he's like, that was not even halfway through my career. Steve had already been in, I think, 17 years at the time. Mm -hmm. I'd only been in 10. And I was already double what I would have been. I mean, uh, what I should have been. And then imagine if I had not caught that and continued down the same path to, as he did, right? And so at that point, I got a full workup uh, with functional medicine docs. And they were like, yeah, man, you're packed full of not just lead, but all these metals. You have leaky gut, you know, you have neuroendocrine dysfunction, low testosterone, low cortisol, secondary hypothyroid fertility issues, severe binocular vision disorder, vestibular damage, white matter lesions on the brain, a lesion on my pituitary gland. It was like all of that stuff was there, right? So I just started at, I didn't care what I had. I wanted to get rid of whatever I had. And that was what I used through functional medicine uh, practice. Quick question. And then between 2012 and when you started getting treated, did you have to deploy again? No, I was, I was picked as an instructor. Okay. Uh, 2013, I went back to a team Uh, I got myself better. My goal is to like, when I went to NICO, they're like, you can medically retire now. I was like, look, I've already been medically discharged out of the Navy. I was an 80% disabled veteran. I gave all that up to come back in. I do not want to go through this path again. I want to be fixed. I want to finish my 20 years. After 20, you can do whatever you want with me. But I was like, this is not an option. I'm deploying next year. And so I did. I went back to a team, uh, you know, went through a bunch more schools was doing real well for a while and then uh, came back. It, when we figured out, we were told, hey, Afghanistan's done. I did my, quote, last combat operation in 2014, have the T-shirt. And uh, we were told, hey, we're not doing this anymore. We're going to do JSETs now. We're going to do training missions. So I was like, all right, you know, I made it my whole career, never doing JRTCs, uh, you know, doing any of these eager lines or flintlock missions or, or J sets, I better use this time wisely to fix myself. If I get promoted, I need to be healthy. So I used 2015. Uh, I was prescribed chelation by the Cleveland Clinic. So I was like, I'm going to go do this now while I'm not deploying. And then uh, I did chelation in 2015. Uh, I believe it was 2015. Uh, and then went overseas to Jordan and then came back and then found out we were going to Africa. So, um, you know, I cleaned myself out, got healthy. And then it was when I went to Africa, everything changed from that point on. Africa did in one month what Afghanistan couldn't do over a 10 year span. Really? So yes, absolutely. What happened in Africa? So while I was in Africa, one, it's, you've been to Afghanistan. I was in remote bases away from everything. You have little burn pits, right? But yeah. In the city in Africa, the entire oh, okay. city's a burn pit, yeah. right? I got you. So you can't even see the sky most days because all the burning waste and exhaust fumes. And then when it's dust season, it banks it all down like it doesn't cobble, right? 
So here I'm in there, migraine headaches, burning nostrils, burning eyes. I know exactly what's happening. I know what's in the environment. And, I'm, you know, we're training in this stuff. We did one day, we did a stress shoot PT event after we'd been on a base where they were burning like rubber tires and bottles all day. And God knows what else was in there. And next thing you know, my lungs are closing up and I'm hyperventilating. I can't breathe. Never happened to me in my entire life in a hundred and friggin' 14 degree weather. Right. And, uh, I was like, Holy crap, put a pulse ox on me. And I was satting at 93% after the exercise, after the PT event. And they, they're like, man, we don't have anything here to treat you or do anything. I thought I might've had a pulmonary embolism, but, uh, they monitored me for like five or six hours until I got above 95. And then, uh, from that point on, I was never able to breathe right again. I did a free fall operation while I was there Never had hypoxia at altitude before. First time it ever happened to me in my entire career. Um, And we weren't even above 9,000 feet that long. And uh, I was like, holy, anyone else feeling this? They're like, no. Were you able to jump still? Yeah, I jumped. Yeah, absolutely. You didn't like pass out while falling, did you? No, absolutely not. Your O2 goes up when you're going down. So, (laughs) so, So, yeah, so no, but it was the first time I ever noticed that. And from that point on, I had breathing difficulties. And then uh, I came back. Yeah, I did a ton of schools. It was the year my dad died, tons of stress. And then I just gutted through everything I could and then went back to Africa. But before I went, I went down to Florida to Tampa to get a heart scan and to make sure I was good cardiovascular wise. I knew something was wrong with my lungs, but you know, my lung scans came back good. My cardio scans, everything was perfect with my hardware, but I had inflammation in my lungs from something, right? So as long as I knew my heart was good, I went back down range. And then while I was there, same thing, burning waste, burning trash, came back and I was having problems. Now my blood pressure was going through the roof and my heart was going off the charts up and down. So, you know, but ever Jeff, since at then, no point you never thought about quitting. At no point you never said, look, this is killing my body from the inside out. That's not an option. It, it's you, What's worse is when you know exactly what's happening and you do it. And what I told everybody, like the docs are like, dude, you shouldn't do this anymore. I'm like, look, I don't have a chance. When, when I got promoted to master sergeant, you cannot, like, that's not going to happen. You can't say you're not. One, it's the best job in the world. It's not a right. It's a privilege. But when you get put in that position, you have to perform. So I, my, my only goal was, was be a liability, not an asset, make sure I'm safe. So I used my time waiting to be a team sergeant as an operations sergeant for the company to start. I was doing hyperbarics. You know, I was doing stuff for my lungs. I was doing everything I could to get better. But, you know, since Africa, stuff was just not as easy to manage. No matter what I was doing dietarily or even with HBOT, HBOT, I was doing great while I was doing it. And then like four months later, things start going back, right? So whatever I was exposed to over there, it, it left a mark on me like permanently right now. I'm still dealing with it right now as far as my nervous system, but it's, you have to go. But finally, you know, my command sergeant major is like, look, dude, you're not doing this anymore. You're done. Right. So they, they made the decision for me. I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I told them, Hey, look, I'll do whatever I have to do. But at a certain point in time, you have to make the call and use intelligence. So you know, I had a good run. I've accomplished everything I wanted to do. I have no, I have no bad feelings about it. I'll give back to the regiment any way I can. You know, I can do a lot more doing what I do now than I could ever done, you know, being influenced over 12 individuals. Is, so. is there anything, and I mean, even the smallest thing, like even just not go to Africa, was there anything that you kind of thought that in retrospect going, that wasn't the smartest decision? Uh I knew going into Africa what it was going to happen. Besides this crap that every you ask anybody who's gone to that country, we, we there's stuff happening to people there that no one can explain, right? We've lost more guys medically from going to Africa without combat than going into Afghanistan with combat as far as not deaths, but med board medical yeah, conditions sure, like right. seizures, strokes, like psychiatric issues, like everything that's happened from these guys coming back. It's, uh, you know, I knew, I knew I was like, man, this is going to be Africa. Like everyone always jokes about it, but everything there kills you. Right. The safest place I've ever been in my career. I tell everybody's in combat, like combat in Afghanistan was like the safest place in my career. There you you knew what to expect, like getting shot or blown up in an ID that that was expected. But 
dying of a stroke or a heart attack or some other toxic exposure related cancer or illness, that's not the way you want to go. And that's unfortunately that we're losing more guys to cancer and suicide than we are combat. So where are you health wise now? So, uh, as far as I, I mountain bike race, it's about the only thing that keeps me above the grass, but I have a problem regulating blood pressure, heart rate, and, uh, my sleep is still shot. I'm still having problems with my nervous system, moving my lungs while I'm sleeping. My lungs stop moving when I'm sleeping. I have hypopnea and, uh, I'm going to neurology to get that squared away now and trying to figure out what's up. Sometimes they can do like a little electrical stimulation on you while you're sleeping, but a CPAP didn't work for me because a CPAP's continual positive air pressure. When your lungs aren't moving, all it is is blowing carbon dioxide in your body and it feels like you're drowning all night. So I told them that when I did my sleep study, they, they noted it in my sleep study. You know, I had zero obstructive sleep apnea. It was all hypopnea events with fragmented sleep and neurological stuff. But they never treated me for that. They just said, okay, you have sleep apnea, here's a CPAP, and that was it. But when a guy has sleep disorders and it's neurological related and their lungs aren't moving the way they're supposed to, that's more than obstructive sleep apnea, right? That's neurological. So you probably should go see a neurologist and try to figure out what's going on with the brain and the, the brain mm-hmm. stem. So that never happened. So I'm forcing that issue now. Now that I'm, I know I'm done. I'm, I'm going to get fixed. I'm, I'm going to do everything I can. Are you worried about your life expectancy because of all this? I know the reality. I know our life expectancy is like Vietnam and uh, the 9-11 responders. Once you've been, been exposed to this stuff, it does shorten your lifespan. Oxidative stress, uh, shortening your telomeres, your body can only reproduce, your cells can only reproduce so many times healthy after they've been damaged that bad. So it, it's a definite reality. I, I know the science behind it. So uh, every day above the grass is a good one. I won't take them for granted. And uh, I'll, I'll do the best I can to do the repair. But I know the damage that's been done. And I, uh, I know what causes it. I'll play devil's advocate. And I don't mean to be morbid or callous yeah. by, for that matter. But in the end, combat will kill you anyway. Absolutely. Like we always joke, my boss and I now, there's no vaccine for a bullet, you know, like, that's that's an honorable way to go. No one wants to die in a hospital bed on hospice uh, with tubes stuck on them and 90 pounds, right? Um, dying in battle, probably the best way to go. Yeah, but is, is that a reality for you that you may end up in a hospital bed just sort of expiring? I mean, have, have you come to grips Absolutely, with that? Absolutely, especially when you watch enough of your friends do it. Um, I got two of my friends right now that I work with that are, they luckily for them, they beat cancer, but I got another buddy with a brain tumor that's told he has to go to hospice uh, two other friends this year, same thing, died of cancer, five of suicide last year. Like, that's definite reality. I mean, to that end, I, I just, you know, I hear this, Jeff, and, and it's unreal. One, that you can recall all the symptoms and everything with a remarkable accuracy. I mean, that in and of itself is, is You don't surprising. forget that. <laughs> yeah, but I, I guess... <laughs> I don't I don't know why I'm I'm pressing on this. I, I just yeah. I, I want to understand how you can look at this whole thing and go, I do it all over again. Um I remember when all this stuff was first happening to me, you said everyone was says, Why me, right? Right. But you realize at a certain point in time in your life you get put in places for a reason. Sure. And if none of this stuff ever happened to me, I wouldn't have been put in a position to help thousands of more. So uh, I don't look at it as okay. a, a curse. I look at it as a blessing. And once you accept that and you figure out your purpose in life, it makes everything else easier. What do you tell your daughter about what's going on with you physically? She knows. Um, she's seen me public speak. Uh, she knows. And um, in this community, she's, <laughs> she's seen my friends die. Like she's suicides and cancer. She's seen it. She knows fully. She's Has she ever gotten old. emotional with you about it? Uh, a couple. Well, she does a couple events with me. Mm-hmm. When uh, some of the guys get up and talk about their stuff and their tears pouring down their face, there's not a dry eye in the room. Uh, she knows the impact of that. She's very switched on and aware. So she hears it, you know, and people go to these events that are dying of cancer and she sees them. So she's very well aware. She's just glad to have her dad around right now. Yeah. I mean, listen, uh, you know, my heart goes out to you and her and I, I pray for you guys and, for as much health as you can have going forward, uh, it, it, it's incredibly tough. You know, as a parent, I, I, I get it. The only fear yeah. I have is a, there are two fears you have as a parent, right? Something happening to your kids 
And the only the reason you one. fear something happening to you is because you'll miss what goes on with your kids. Right. Like Absolutely. That's, uh, you hit it. That, that's my two biggest fears right there. It, it, it's not my life that's ending that I worry. It's my kid's life without me and what I would miss in their yep. lives that that really kind of rips my heart out when I think about anything that may may affect me down the road. And and to that end, you know, I just yeah. uh, I I know you said you don't take any day for granted. I just sometimes that would overcome me. I, are there days yeah. where it, it, it gets to you emotionally? Uh, no, uh, not emotionally, but the thought is always there. Like I just said, I got to make it till she gets married. You know, that's like, that, that's your goal, right? Mm-hmm. Just make, until, until that man walks her down the aisle and it's his responsibility to take care of her. My mission's done. Right. So that's, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be alive. I can tell you that. So it, she had to have a dad. My, after I had a kid, my main priority was to be a father and ensure the success of that child. That kept me alive. No way of or but about it. And if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't be here. I mean, Jeff, it, part of it is inspiring, uh, your will to go on, because there are a lot of people who who would have sort of tapped out or just succumbed to what was in front of them because the odds and the, the number of sheer things that you're dealing with was it would be enough to overcome the strongest people. I mean, it's just yeah. that's just the I reality. Can, I can honestly tell you the, the worst struggle I ever had were toxic leaders in the medical the medical establishment yeah. were my two biggest hurdles. Hurdles. It wasn't combat. It wasn't dealing with the effects of all this stuff. It was trying to get better with people who didn't want to listen to what you were saying and who knew everything and didn't. It was all in your head. You know, you can't have all these things wrong with you. You know, take this drug. And it it was literally like all they cared about. And I understand why. You know, I, I work at a higher enough level to know, but their priority is readiness. They're mm-hmm. not there to fix you, make you feel better, be optimal. They need bodies to fill numbers. Like you're a position. And once you're above the company level at battalion, you stop seeing people and you start seeing numbers. And I and I witnessed it all the way through the ranks going up. And I can see why it happens. It's 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 not personal, it's professional, it's business, right? And uh, but I figured out like once you understand that you're a number. And that, you know, you're above that level is looking down on you in the medical establishment, wherever it was. Can you deploy? Yes or no. That's all that matters. And if the answer is no, they will get rid of you as fast as possible. And that's why guys don't say anything. I am. Yep. Are you okay? Yep. Everyone knows that's BS where we work, but you have to say yes. If you don't say yes, we're on the first thing smoking out. So until that environment changes, which it is changing now, uh, it's going to be the same thing. Guys are going to dry themselves on the ground till the wheels fall off, or they're going to kill themselves because they feel like they're a letdown. What so, would you What would you say uh, to anybody? You've mentioned a couple of times. You just said it about guys killing themselves. Yeah. And what would you say to somebody who is, you know, contemplating taking their own life at this point? And somebody who's struggling. How do you reach them? One, you're not alone. Two, someone gives a shit about you. Three, you know, don't isolate, insulate. You know, you're not going to find your answer at the bottom of a bottle or a pill jar, right? You have to get around other people who are positive, healthy, and constructive. Stay out of the damn bars. Stay away from anything that says 22 on it, pretty much, that wants to go around the country drinking and getting loaded and say they're preventing suicide. Don't get involved with organizations like that. Get with healthy, like-minded people who want to be well and do better and recover. Misery loves company. Stay away from it. Um, you know, pick up the phone, get a hold of organizations that are providing treatments and not band-aids that are actually looking at the whole person and not just a three letter acronym. Uh, get involved with those institutions. They're out there. And uh, like I said, they're not alone. So find a new purpose, find something that, you know, gives you the excuse to put your feet on the ground every day and get out of bed and serve a purpose. And it might not be being the commando you once were or whatever you were, but find a new purpose. Your story or, you know, what happened to you can help someone else. So get yourself better and then go be the next advocate, be the next leader that goes out there and reaches out and grabs that person and pulls them up out of the ground. That's what we have to do. And uh, it, telling people not to kill themselves obviously is not working. Uh, hotlines, do n- they're not working, right? Suicides tripled in our community this year. We spent three times the amount of money doing suicide, you know, awareness and prevention. It's not. You have to ask why are guys killing themselves? Look at the physiological risk factors, not only the psychological, 
psychological risk factors and then start doing stuff. Uh, we can see when a guy's about to kill himself by looking at his biology because we can see how they're feeling, how their brain's working, you know, how their metabolism's working, how much sleep they're not getting. All those things are out there. Those red flags we can see uh, through diagnostics. So asking a person, they're not going to tell you the truth. Filling out surveys, you know, post-deployment health assessments, no one enter, answers those things honestly. So uh, I don't have to ask guys, you know, how are you feeling? I know what they do for a living and where they go. I know what it does to them. So I don't even try to blow smoke up anyone's butt. Say, hey, bud, I, look, I already, I'm not going to ask you, are you damaged or broken or feeling this way? How bad, right? I'm not even going to ask if, how bad is it? And then let's get you better. Let's look at how bad it is and then get you fixed. So it's, we, we have to stop asking these questions. We know what's going on. And this isn't just in the military. It's in the civilian sector too. So yeah. the numbers are going up together. Perfectly said, Jeff. I, I think that is the perfect way to punctuate this. Uh, I think your message is clear on that. And certainly I wish you nothing but good health going forward. I know it'll be a struggle, but I certainly know that you'll be able to fight through it. And uh, best to you, your daughter and the rest of your family. But certainly thank you for being so honest and so open about everything that you've had to deal with. And thanks for being part of the Hazard Ground, brother. All right. Thank you. You've been listening to the Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno and produced by Matt Pascarella. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at hazardgroundpodcast at gmail.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on iTunes. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.